Hi, I'm Kevin Matthews, film fan living in Edinburgh. This week I have mainly been running my little legs off and melting my Fitbit as I train for the Edinburgh Marathon in less than two months and I will be hitting you all up for sponsorship options on the Raiders of the Podcast page. Hi, I'm Craig, English film nerd living in Wales and uh, both of this week's films made me weep at the halfway mark. One, because something profoundly moving happened. The other, because it was the halfway mark. Stay tuned to find out which is which. Mystery. I'm Tyler Hosley, and I can't wait until we do the Trevor Sims special, you guys. So keep in mind, Adrenia Chrome 2 is coming out this year. Yeah, don't make jokes like that. <laughs> Not cool, man. I'm Dave Gray, and I like puppies. Stuffed unicorns, Lucky Charm cereal, and throwing used bowls at my neighbors. And this is Raiders of the Podcast. <laughs> this week, I didn't really have much of a viewing this week of, of any movies, but I did watch something that will come up at the end of this episode for next week, so I'm going to just, I'm going to sit on it. I went to the theater and saw Unsane. I saw oh, Ready Player One. I totally forgot I saw Ready Player One. What the fuck was that? I'm sorry. You can go first if you want and talk about that. <laughs> and then I'll... I totally forgot. I saw Ready Player One. It was okay. That's that's about all I can say. Not great. Not terrible. It was okay. Popcorn flick. I'm sorry, dude. I God, I can't believe no. that just totally phew, gone. That says how much of an impression it left. But, but did it improve the parts of the book as you imagined it would? It, it Yeah, yeah. I, actually it did. The book, there's two sequences where they have Wade reenact movies. And in the book, it is literally just reading pages of dialogue from the movie. Yeah. Which is the worst thing ever. Mm -hmm. In the movie, it's actually a really fun little sequence. They actually let Wade, Wade have a relationship with the girl, Artemis. And she's not just a prize he wins at the end like everything else. So that's an improvement. But really, Wade is still the most boring, bland white guy ever written. That's saying a lot in a culture filled with boring, bland white guys as leads. They should have just cut his ass out and had Olivia Cook's Artemis be the lead character and kept everything else the same. Mm. Just no stupid romance. And no stupid, oh, I've got a Port Weinstein birthmark. I'm hideous. Bullshit. I'm sorry. That's, oh. Now that I remember it, I'm annoyed. <laughs> How was my pretend wife? Was she, was she good in it? Yeah, she was fine. The, the cast is fine. Ty Sheridan is the most bland actor ever. So, you know, it's really easy to imprint yourself on him if that's what you do. Which is what they're hoping you'll do. That's why there's so many bland-ass white guys in the leads of movies. Yeah, it's okay. Obviously, it's not good enough to leave a lasting impression that I remembered seeing it a week later. I saw Unsane, the uh, new soda... We, um, I really dug it. I think uh, I thought Soderbergh uses the iPhone aesthetic really well. It has some nice unsettling atmosphere, um, some dark comedy scattered throughout, and the the performances are all solid. Claire Foy is a good lead, but um, Juno Temple totally steals the show. The trailer is really misleading, though. I mean, it's a lot more straightforward than what it makes it out to be, which isn't a bad thing at all. It's I really dug it. I also saw what else did I watch? Uh, oh, yeah, I watched the um, Tupac movie, All Eyes on Me. It's not quite as good as Notorious or Straight Outta Compton, but it's still really good. A little a little over long. I, I don't think it needed to be two and a half hours, but uh, I think his name's Demetrius Ship. He is fantastic in it. The dude is like Tupac reincarnated. Um, so if you dug any of the hip-hop biopics, it's totally worth checking out. I, I liked it quite a bit. And I also watched Justice League, and I loved it. I don't care what anyone says. DC totally blows Marvel out of the water. Better characters, better films. I love DC stuff, so, yeah. I stumbled across a movie called Terrifier in the new movie section on Amazon Video, and I, like, immediately discounted it because it has a scary clown on the cover. And I don't watch horror movies with scary clowns on the covers. And they especially, like, post its reboot like i'm avoiding shit like that like the plague but then i saw a couple of like fairly positive comments on facebook so I thought, okay i'll roll the dice give it a go and i'm glad i did because it's, it's pretty good fun 
It's super basic. A murderous clown with a bin liner full of tools goes on a Halloween night rampage. Like, nothing more to it. No fucking about. Clown, bag of tools, gory death. It's nice and simple. The performances, the cinematography, the script, the score, they're all, they're all above average for, you know, for this sort of thing, for like an indie sort of slasher. What puts it slightly above, above average is has a strong villain, some good gore, and just a few like weird, unexpected moments and some good dark humour. David Howard Thornton is excellent as Art the Homicidal Clown. He's creepy, he's funny, he's just a really well-judged performance. The kills, they aren't all winners, but a couple of them are really, are, they're spectacular. There's a bisection by Hacksaw that, that Tyler will love. Like, Tyler will, he'll weep. He'll, he'll weep from his cock watching this kill. It is something. I would recommend you crank a window before watching it, Tyler, because you might just drown in a torrent of psycho clown murder jizz. Yeah, it's generic as hell on the surface, but there's gore and there's laughs and there's some weird, unexpected shit going on, and it's worth 80 minutes of your time. I'm glad I gave it a shot. And then I thought, well, I discounted that. I'm going to go back to another one I just skipped past and discounted. So I watched 24 Hours to Live, which is a new action movie from some of the folks behind John Wick. Again, looked super generic, and it starts out as I had expected. Uh, a burned-out, grieving company hitman, played by Ethan Hawke, takes a very lucrative contract, only to fall in love with his target, played by Brian Dennehy. That's 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 a joke. That's my oh, April I was I was like <laughs> this close to being interested in the movie. <laughs> my head just snapped up in into like an attentive stance, <laughs> yeah. and then you're like, oh no, it's yeah, a joke. you want to see that like, film ah, now? That. I do. God, so bad. I'd also take Keanu no. falling in love with Brian Dennehy. Sorry. That was my little April Fool's joke, because it was, I missed April Fool's, so there you go. I actually went through a bunch of possibilities for that stupid joke. Uh, Danny Glover, uh, Danny DeVito, Ted Levine, Louis Gossett Jr. I wish I'd gone with Louis Gossett Jr., but, you know. I'm glad you didn't. So, yeah, I, I would have broken my neck. <laughs> I I would have given myself whiplash with how quick I spun around to get for my <laughs> it, attentive look. Yep. And you would have been crushed if it doesn't exist, so I'm glad it didn't hurt you like that. Um, so, yeah, it seems super generic, but then it takes a really... There's a bizarre twist at the end of the first act. And then after that, it's still fairly generic, standard redemption story, but I dug for a goofy little twist at the end of the first act. I think Ethan Hawke was great in it. I, I like that he puts effort into these STD gigs, because you look at people like John Cusack, Bruce Willis, they just don't even fucking try. They just sleepwalk through it. And Hawk at least gives it his all, so I appreciate that. Got a really good supporting cast. You've got this name. I'm going to mangle it because I haven't got a clue. King Sue is uh, the female lead. Paul Anderson from uh, that television show. <laughs> what's, what's the British Boardwalk Empire? Peaky Blinders. Paul Anderson from Peaky Blinders. Uh, you've got Rutger Hauer. You've got Liam Cunningham. They're all really good. Being that it comes from some of the John Wick people, it's the action that makes it a little special. And it is, oh man, like, it's well choreographed and it's shot and edited really cleanly, which is so rare these days. That's, you know, that's that's a big bonus. But most importantly, man, it is it's so fantastically violent in that why shoot a man once when you can shoot him twice, cut his throat, then shoot him five more times kind of way that makes John Wick so fun. This, my poster quote for this film, because it's something I said during the big final action scene, is, oh, fucking fuck. So if you're someone wants to put that on the poster, that's what I thought of um, 24 Hours to Live. It's, it's a lot of fun. And when it, when it kicks into gear, when it's being like super, super brutal violent, it's just, it's kind of wonderful. So I'm going to be keeping an eye on the director, Brian Smurz. <laughs> guessing his name is his surname is spelled s-m-r-z that's not a real name brian smurz but i liked your film and then i watched henry portrait of a serial killer 2 mask of sanity and that's still a festering shit stained anal wart if it were a human being i would shoot it in the face for an hour then drone strike its funeral in order to sever its bloodline forever it is fucking garbage and i hate myself for watching it again did you not get to meshes of the afternoon yet? Not yet. I was too busy hurting myself with Henry too. Um, I know that I hate that film. 
<laughs> Why? Do, I've not even been brave enough to watch it. That's how shit I suspect it is. It's Hallmark Henry. Oh, God. It's pretty bad, yeah. Right, let's stop talking about it, otherwise Tyler will pick it soon to hurt me. I do have it on VHS, so <laughs> but, like, I wouldn't pick it. It's garbage, so... <laughs> I had a, a busy week. Um, like Tyler, I watched Justice League. Different motivation, really. My wife and I sort of had a conversation about we should try and watch one or two films together every week instead of me just watching shit that she looks at, rolls her eyes and says, why are you watching that? And my usual response is Tyler or Craig. So we started with uh, Justice League, which, uh, yeah, it's still... It's all right. It's entertaining enough. It has decent moments, and it's a, it's another bit of a mess. But it's got enough in there that's more fun than uh, certainly from where they started with just mopey grey man of steel. So it was all right. Then Catherine's turn was uh, she got me to watch the first Wives Club. I thought I might have seen, but then I don't think I'd ever seen it. So Bette Midler, Goldie Hawn, Dan Keaton, and have been treated badly by their husbands and want to get back at them. It doesn't start too cheerily for a comedy. Stockard Channing is a woman who is hard done by by her husband and throws herself off a balcony. Uh, that's so, you know, you're starting from suicide. You've got to then really start lining up the gags for a comedy. But it was uh, it was good, Bette Midler. It's, um, I think it's, it's good now and again to remember how how funny she can be, and this probably isn't her funniest role, because I have fond memories of her and other stuff, but she was uh, definitely the highlight here. Goldie Home is really good as well, and Diane Keaton does her straight legs, but, um, but they're, they're all good, all good fun. I then tortured myself by watching Atlantic Rim, <clears throat> which is the asylum <laughs> version of Pacific Rim, you got to love the cheek of them, but no, it's... Why it's... does it sound more sexual when it's from, uh, <laughs> from the asylum? I mean, it's awful. It's it's not it's not the worst from them, but that's because they, they get really low. But basically, you have three people who are essentially like red, green, and blue. That's what they are, because that's it, the colouring of the robots as well. well. I say robots. The little computerised things that have been done for like... 20 quid from the neighbor's kids who had a Sega they could use. And then you see shots of actors in the little cockpits again, which is badly lit wall with some piping and whatever lights correspond to the color of the robot. That's what it is. I've seen better special effects on old episodes of Let's Pretend, which was a program here in the UK. Well, we can I say to you guys, but trust me, that was low budget. Who's appearing purely to cover really brutal alimony payments? Well, the, the Anyone biggest, I know of? The biggest name in it, well, there's a guy called Treach. I can't remember his full name, but he has the, <laughs> he has the name Treach in the middle in quotation yeah. marks, so I think that's how he's best known. But uh, the one person really that I knew was, was Graham Green, who plays, um, who he's done quite a few, he's, he's a, a Native American, does Native American roles. And I've gone blank on what else he's been in. He was the person when he appeared, even though it was still a terrible script and really none of the performances were good. He was that little drop of water in the desert, you know, like, oh, he's, he's back. He's, he's there. It'll be okay. It'll be over soon. Is he the Native American chap from Parks and Rec? No. No, no I don't think so. You big horrible racist. I know. <laughs> but there are only like three Native American actors, so yeah, I can't remember if he was the one with the guy, uh, with the guy, with uh, Mel Gibson and Maverick. He's the guy from Maverick. Uh, He's the guy in Maverick. Die yeah. Hard with a Vengeance. Yeah, it's other other cop in Die Hard with a Vengeance. Yeah. 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 He's he's recognizable, and sometimes that's that's all we can hope for, in these ones, especially in that. I watched the wonderful trashiness of Flowers in the Attic. That is quite the delight. It really, really is. I thought when I, when I decided to watch this that if I liked it, 
I would be liking it kind of ironically and laughing at it. But that's not the case. It just, it really knows what it's setting out to do based on the, the novel by Virginia Andrews. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into the, the plot, but Victoria Tennant's in there, uh, basically as a, a mother taking her kids to the, sorry, the, the grandparents. It's a very basic summary. It's one of her better roles, because I've only seen her otherwise in a couple of things with Steve Martin, which was with him. And Louise Fletcher is quite an unloving grandmother. And you've got uh, Christy Swanson. Is it Christy Swanson or Kirsty Swanson? Always get them mixed up. It's Christy, Christy Swanson. Yeah, it's Christy. It's, yeah. it's, it's wonderful, trashy, fun. And it, it knows it all the way. And But everyone sort of, it's like everyone got the memo. Do you know what I mean? When you're watching it like yeah. that, nobody's seeming embarrassed or thinking they should dial it down. They'll dial it up. Especially worth watching for the scene in which Christy Swanson, you know, angrily starts chopping her hair off and stuff. And it's, it's glorious. And last but by no means least, I watched uh, two films that were on a movie here in the UK by the director of uh, Force Majeure. Uh, he's, he's a talented guy. I really like him. Ruben Osland. One was called Involuntary. And it was about people who are either being passive or being quite proactive in situations and how those pans out. It was almost a, an intercut anthology the way it was done. Uh, it was just disconnected stories, but looking at the same thing. And one called Play it was about a bunch of kids who want to bully these other kids, but they they really play a kind of long con with them in terms of hours of the day and dragging these kids from pillar to post, and it gets you quite on edge. It's quite interesting. I like his stuff, so I would recommend checking his stuff out for people who uh, maybe, like me, had only previously known of Force Majeure. Uh, he's really good. Oh, I watched The Ritual, which was awesome horror, and Eye Boy, which was not so awesome, one of those Netflix movies that part of me wants Dave to watch so he can get rage. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we move on, Craig. Yes. The guy from Parks and Rec, who was the chief of the Wamapoke, was yeah. played by Jonathan Joss. Okay. Who's, he's one of those actors that's in like a lot of small parts in TV. You yeah. probably know him best as um, John Redcorn on King of the Hill. Okay. If you've seen uh, King of the Hill. No, it's Gil Birmingham I'm thinking of, I think. No, it's not. Gil Burning. No. Okay, there must be like four Native American actors. I thought yeah. that guy I was thinking of had one of the leads in the ad- adaptation of Scout, which I'm really looking forward to, but I guess they changed the casting at some point. This week, we watched the 1971 Peter, Bog- Peter Bogdanovich. I can't say his name fast, or I say it wrong. Pete. No, I can say Peter. It's Bogdanovich. <laughs> I have trouble. <laughs> I just, just call him Pete. That's Based on... Funny. Larry McMurtry's semi-autobiographical novel, The Last Picture Show. We also watched the 1995 Rachel Talale. Talale? Talale. 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 Uh, based on the comic series by Alan Martin and Jamie Hewitt, Tank Girl. I'm going to let Kevin pick. So pick a movie, Kevin. Tell us about it. Uh, this, this is tough. Right, I'm going to go with... Uh, flip going. I'm going to go with the last picture show. Damn. Um, I I'd I'd seen. Sorry. I didn't want to have to describe Tank Girl. So, all right. It's, it's okay. Do you want me to pick Tank Girl? No, it's fine. It's to... fine. No, no, no. Are you, 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 are you go ahead. That? You go are ahead. You doing that thing. No, no, like, no, 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 like, no, no, no. When go my ahead. wife gets me a choice, I, I, no. It's, no, really, it's okay. <laughs> no. No, I was just, I was just hoping fact. that you'd like bite the bullet because you do that normally when I toss it to you first. You take the one I don't want to do. This time you didn't. So please continue with the last picture show. <laughs> son of a bitch. He's a son of a bitch, isn't he, Dave? More and more of each part. He is a son of a bitch. <laughs> I find. I'm, I'm rapidly changing my opinion of the last picture show, but I'll get to it now. <laughs> uh, Narcissus Craig's choice. I'd seen both of the picks this week before. But it had been a long time. So I, I was genuinely looking forward to revisiting both. The last picture show 
in particular had fond memories of, but very vague memories, so didn't know anything about it. The basic plot is it's set in a small American town that is in a way kind of just, well, I would describe it as quietly drying up and dying. That was the, the connecting theme I thought this week. And uh, the main characters are Timothy Bottoms, plays a young lad called Sonny. So it's really about him and his experiences in the town. And it's um, it's got a great cast. Jeff Bridges is his friend Dwayne. Sybil Shepherd is a girl who's mainly with Dwayne called JC, right? Is that right? Yeah. And then there's Ben Johnson playing Sam Lyon, who's kind of the owner of a local diner uh, pool hall area where they uh, where they go. As Dave said, it's based on the the novel by Larry Mc, McMurray, which so he did the screenplay with P E B and <laughs> and uh, P E B director. I've seen I've seen Paper Moon as well from Bogdanovich, which I I loved. And um, I think it's 2014. She's funny that way, which I really, really didn't love. So I think he's one that I mean, he's had a long career, but a lot of his this era is where his great stuff is, as far as I'm concerned. And the last picture shows black and white throughout. You can almost sort of taste the sand in the air and just get the feeling of nothing much to do. This is a town that is wound down before everyone else is ready for it. The residents are all interested in the, the local football game and how the team does. And when we first meet Timothy Bottoms as Sonny, they've not had a good game, so they're not really being welcomed with uh, big waves and smiles. It's a great film for evoking that atmosphere, as well as those mentioned, Cloris Leachman's there as a as a sort of middle-aged housewife who ends up seeking affection somewhere unexpectedly. Uh, Ellen Burstyn is Jace's mum. Got a young and dapper Randy Quaid in there. And is Clue Gulliger? Clue Gulliger? Yeah. His intro is amazing. It's amazing. Is he collecting money from Sam Lyon for the bet? Or I noted this down because I think the, the, the script is... Because it's based on the characters and their sort of developments, it doesn't have to have, you know, every line is a sharp line. But it's got some crackers. I mean, Sam Lyon is, is paying it for his bet. He says, that's what I get for betting on my hometown. Ought to have more sense. And Clue Gallagher says, you ought to have a better hometown. I just think that's, that was a superb line early on that really, really sums up, I think, how a lot of people are feeling, even while they're still staying there. Tensions arise, people get involved in, in things that are kind of rites of passage and they're changing, they're trying to make out on dates, they're doing all the usual teenage stuff. I just think this, this film captures that really well. And as I say, in, in a town that I think it's, well, if it's not already wound down further than it should, it's, it's almost, it's one that's been passed over. It's the sort of place that people thought that time of the century would certainly be starting to leave rather than grow up in and it's got that throughout, it's got a sense of a sort of it's a town on life support it's just ready to, to fade away and die, I think it's great I think a lot of the acting is really good, especially from the, the younger ones who have that I wouldn't say it's like the wide eyed nature but they have the, they've got almost like the vibrancy of youth with moments of them starting to realise what the bigger picture might be looking like for them, which isn't great. Um, certainly when they look around their, their homes. Yeah, it's a classic. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed revisiting it. And yeah, well done, Craig. This this almost makes up for a Juno crew. I didn't make it. <laughs> Had you seen it before? I hadn't, no. All right, right. Well, it was go. in so, that uh, Criterion set, which I busted open to watch Head, to watch and be confused by Head. I thought, I need to dig back into that again. So, And at this moment, I think it's still for a week or so, it's on Mubi in the K. Uh, so it's it's on Filmstruck. 
It, not in the, I thought it was it, here, but well, not not in the UK version at the moment. So I don't know why it was here. crossover with that with that um with us having the movie titles. I lost my way, but then I found it again. Well, I um, watched it on movie. It was shameful. Hopefully it'll <laughs> go up. He was on the other side of the room and the remote was in my hand, so I watched it on movie. That's just not cool, man. Mm -mm. So apparently I watched the wrong movie because Kevin didn't mention how awesome the song Time Warp was or how great Tim Curry was as Frankenfurter. I'm just kidding. I wouldn't have known this was actually made in the 70s if no one told me because I really thought this was a 50s movie. This was this was a great coming-of-age film, though. I, I can't believe I hadn't seen it until yesterday. I, and I was actually surprised on how hard-hitting this actually was. It's so bleak, but it's bleak in a different way. You're watching these characters struggle to find their place in life, and it's it's pretty hard-hitting. Um, there's so much brutal realism, realism in that, and uh, it's done wonderfully here. Uh, the black and white cinematography looked gorgeous. I fucking love black and white cinematography, and uh, it looks amazing here. Jeff Bridges and Civil Shepherd are incredible. Bridges has been great in almost everything he's ever been in ever, but this may be my favorite performance from him. Um, yeah, he was wonderful. Uh, I do think it has a couple tiny, like tiny pacing issues in the middle, but it's not enough to bring the film down at all. Uh, it's it's damn near perfect, and I'm totally glad I finally got to see it. I uh, I had to wait until yesterday to see this because my fucking whoever delivered it or whoever sent it from eBay decided to take their sweet fucking time. And uh, I want to bring their username up because I want to murder them because I was a fucking idiot. But anyways, yeah, great movie, Craig. I'm happy I finally got to see this. And I know you didn't make it, but you picked it, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I I will need to ask we all assume that Dave has all the info, right? Dave, this is your role. So am I misremembering, or did director PEB end up, uh, was he quite smitten with Sybil Shepherd, or am I thinking of some other director star thing? Yeah, they dated. That's why she's the lead in Daisy Miller. So yes, I did actually know the answer to that. And um, is he called Peter B because he was he was a legendary B-boy? Yes. 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 Excellent. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I hate to admit it, but I'm with Tyler and Craig. Is this is the first time I've seen it? And like Craig, I also have the Criterion Edition in the box set with Head. This is one that I I hadn't gone to before because Peter Bogdanovich has made a lot of shitty shitty movies. It's like Kevin mentioned earlier. He has the beginning of his career was great past couple of years I've gone back and I've watched his earlier stuff. He did Targets in like 1968 and that's pretty solid. Last Picture Show was great. Then he did What's Up Doc, Paper Moon and Daisy Miller and they're all good movies worth watching. And that brings him up to 1974 and everything after that is kind of garbage. Not like like a little garbage, I mean like straight up garbage. But Last Picture Show is yeah, it's it's really well made. The cast is great. Sybil Shepard is, she is just on some other level in her looks department. Mm. Young Sybil Shepard is fucking Crazy. amazing. And I don't blame Peter Bogdanovich for being mildly obsessed with her because, or anybody in the movie for being mildly obsessed with her because she is unique, Lee special looking. The character of JC is awful. I mean, I just, she just, only makes sense if you look at her from that perspective because she doesn't have much of a personality. But to be fair, neither does uh, Timothy Bottom, Sonny, or Jeff Bridges, Dwayne. As a coming of age film, this is one of the all time greats. I'm not a big fan of them normally, but this one I was fully invested in. It's beautifully shot. It really communicates how life in this, this dying town is during this specific time period. Cloris Leachman is great in her role. Cloris Leachman carries the emotional weight of this film in her scenes, and she is fantastic. I don't think I've ever seen Cloris Leachman do a dramatic role offhand. I, I mostly know her doing comedy, so I, I was I was not prepared for how excellent she was. Um, Ellen Burstyn is really good in her part as the cook and waitress of the local diner. It's a really good. It, no, that was that was Eileen Brennan, wasn't it? Oh, God damn it, you're right. Eileen Brennan. I can't believe I just 
Burstyn was um, JC's mother. mother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't. Uh, it's it's the initials. I wrote. I switched them when I wrote my notes. My bad. I'm sorry. In Me re- and uh, PEB, forgive you. Yeah, sweet. That's that's going to become a thing. PEB. Then soon. Randy Quaid popped up, and that was weird. I've never seen him or Jeff Bridges so young. I I thought they were both you know sprung into this world at how they look in the movies I grew up watching them as. I know that sounds weird, but yeah, it just yeah. I had a strange moment of disconnect when I saw them both. It's like, wow. Well, how is Timothy Bottoms not a Bridges? Because when that film started, I thought that was Jeff Bridges. It, <laughs> they look really, really eerily similar. Yeah. But Jeff Bridges is really young in this. And then, then and Jeff one of the up. one of the other actors is Sam Bottoms. I mean, is that yeah, that's his that brother. Bottom's dad. Yeah, his yeah. brother. And he plays yeah. his brother in the movie. I think they actually they have another brother um who's also an actor. Dusty. No, I <laughs> <laughs> is that, um, is that a... Joseph. I knew I'd remember it. Joseph Bottoms. He was in um the Black Hole. Missed opportunity. Bottoms Senior. No, that's better than what? being Bottoms Junior. Dusty, Rusty and <laughs> Bottoms the fifth. I mean, that is not a position anyone wants to be in. But yeah, no, Last Picture Show is great. If you're in the U.S., it is on Filmstruck. If you haven't seen it, it's worth watching. If you have seen it and it's been a while, it is one of those revisits that you just will not regret. It's a little long, but the runtime flies by. The cast give fantastic performances. And I understand why Peter Bogdanovich has been able to build a, a reputation off this film because here we are, we're 40, yeah, we're, we're almost 50 years out, and it's still amazing. It, it holds up. This is one of those all-time classics of American cinema. I'm glad I finally got pushed into seeing it. That's my poster quote, that whole paragraph. Okay, yeah, this is my pick. I hadn't seen it. It's a shame lister. I hope you all like waffles, because I am about to waffle like a motherfucker. Yeah, I, every now and then I see a film and it's like, it's so remarkable and masterful and generally fucking wonderful. But I almost feel like I'm no more qualified to discuss it than I am to discuss string theory. Like, I just, just it just amazes me so much I don't feel like I can talk about it in a, in an even halfway intelligible way or without disappearing up my own ass. So I'm going to try, but I think I, think I might fail. Yeah, for me, this is just a masterpiece. I, it blew me away. Really hit home for me in a lot of ways. That transitional time in a young person's life that this film covers, the uh, the weight of seemingly life-defining choices that need to be made. I remember, I certainly felt the weight of that when I was that age, and now I can see my own son going through that same thing. And I don't think I've ever seen it illustrated so beautifully in a in a coming of age film before i think this film i think it captures something truly profound the relationships between sunny and ruth and between sunny and sam the lion i think those those were really strong they were really really the, the strongest parts of the movie for me they're they're kind of perfect distillation i think of this of some of the movie's themes you got this young character and he's reaching a point where he has to forge his own path in the world, and he's connected to these other older characters who are lamenting the the paths not chosen. And it makes for a really kind of wistful, bittersweet, beautiful film. And I think I think all the characters are so layered and interesting, and the relationships between them are layered and interesting. Like uh, especially Sonny and Ruth. Uh, that's that's the bit that really hit home for me. It's just it's just wonderful to watch. Like on the surface, there's this. There's a genuine shared affection between them, but beneath that you have, there's, there's so much more to it. You have these kind of two lost souls looking to stop the world turning for a little while. And it's really, really, I found it really, really moving. I knew I would disappear at my own ass, but it just, we talked about like how much we were broken by uh, the film Sick. But this film broke me a couple of times and they were really quite, they weren't big moments, they were small moments, but they just, they had so much weight to them, and I just, I blubbed a few times in this film. I, I blubbed, well, I'll get to that in a second. The cast are like 
they're, they're wonderful. Like, I'm not at all familiar with Timothy Bottoms or Cloris Leachman, but I intend to change that because I think they're both amazing. Like, I try not to give a shit about Oscars, but I'm so glad Leachman got one for this because it's really well deserved. The first bit that really made me cry, she delivers a line, just a little line, like, I don't dance much. And I don't know, it just it just hit me really hard. It broke me. And, you know, like, it's not a big moment, but I... <laughs> I kind of just I wept a little bit. It just floored me because her performance was just so, so good, so like, truthful. I loved her. Um, ben Johnson was tremendous. Ellen Burstyn was fantastic. Sybil Shepherd, Jeff Bridges, Eileen Brennan—they're all pitch perfect. It's like a beautifully acted movie. It's a beautifully scripted movie. It's a beautifully shot movie. It is just beautiful in general. I, I loved it. It's tough to articulate my thoughts because I know. I can't remember which film it was. Dave talked about watching a film that was that hit him quite hard, and then he'd watched it right before we were recorded. Maybe it was sick last time around, and when you, then you tried to talk about it like an hour or so later, and it's still kind of percolating. And yeah, that's how I feel about this. And plus, it's one of those films that it works like a universal theme so well that it it feels like a film about my life at points, and that just makes me want to go off on a thousand different tangents. So sorry, <laughs> I just got to stop talking about it. But yeah, I. I just thought it was a masterpiece. I feel it will reward me many times over in the future when I rewatch it. I just, I adored it. I really, really did. What was the other bit that really made me blub? Um, da, 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 da. Ah, what's the actress's name? Ellen Burstyn. The moment Ellen Burstyn runs away during a character's funeral and you connect it to a scene earlier and realise the connection she has to that character, that just, that broke me as well. I was just, yeah, I loved it. <laughs> Still waffling. I said I was going to waffle, but... All right, the other film we watched this week was Rachel Talele's 1995 sci-fi action comedy based on a comic book by Alan Martin and Jamie Hewlett, Tank Girl. I'm trying to think of how to... Just... Okay, Tank Girl is an unneeded backstory of underground comic character. That's basically it. That's it. Tank Girl's an anti-hero, and she has a friend, Jet Girl, and they have mutant friends, the Rippers, and they're fighting water and power, which is led by Malcolm McDowell. I'm a fan of the comic series, so that does affect my view on the movie, and I just do not like the movie. It's not the cast fault. Naomi Watts plays Jet Girl, and she's really good with what she's given. Lori Petty is... Tank Girl, and she plays it as well as anybody could. Malcolm McDowell is always a fun villain. It's just, the whole movie is too cute and too desperate to be cult without earning it. It's not the absolute insanity that the comic is, which is which is a bit of a, a misstep for me, because I, I absolutely love the anarchic spirit in the original source. Iggy Pop pops up, which is an awkward phrase. It's too busy trying to be cutesy than being actually interesting. None of the few action scenes are any fun. None of the character interactions are fun. It's a lot of try-hard for me. The director is not competent enough to pull this insanity off, and it feels like they even forgot to film certain scenes. So instead, they stuck in still comic panels and animated two of them, which would be fine if that was something they were going for, but it doesn't feel that way. It feels like it's an afterthought. It feels like they went, oh, shit, we didn't do this part, and we really need to do this part to make it make sense. It's it's all on the director. She doesn't know how to approach this material, and I don't think it's so much you know her fault for not knowing how to approach the material. She's just the wrong person for this job. And tragically, she's a director who in the early 90s was often the wrong person for the job. And that's that's a shame because for me, this movie could be so much better than it actually is. After watching it, I did read some comments from the original creators. I felt much better knowing that it was a sore spot for them as well. It just It just doesn't, it's not what it should be. And I respect a lot of the things that they're going for. Strong female hero at that time in a comic book movie is mind-blowing. I just don't think it reaches what it could, and it's given a pass by a lot of people just for trying. Which, as you know, that's not Dave's way. 
they dumbed down a lot of the characters, especially what they did to Booga. In in the comic, he's one of my favorite characters because he's fun. And instead of finding a way to show him being loyal to Tank Girl, they make him a dog, like a literal reincarnated dog, which is just, it's cheap. Instead of actually showing these characters, they're all these really scaled back, simplified, and often dumbed down versions. I found this whole movie very frustrating. Very frustrating. Yeah, sorry, T, I can't give this one a pass. Fuck this movie. I'm pretty much with you, man. I, I, I'm not going to say fuck this movie because I don't, my feelings are not that strong. I do, I have no strong feelings about Tank Girl. I'm not familiar with the comics. So there's not, it doesn't have that edge to it. But I still feel like it is a missed opportunity because there are elements that I feel are really strong, but there are two major failings in the direction and the script, which are sort of, you know, they're important. Most of the parts are there to make a good movie, but they have not been put together correctly. And I mean, there is, like I said, there's good stuff. Every good thing in this film comes with a caveat. I enjoyed Lori Petty. She is breaking her fucking back trying to make this thing work. Giving 150%, just busting every vein in her temple, just trying to make it work. But she's she's up a creek without a paddle, script-wise. There's just nothing there for her. And there's a scene where a character looks out of the window of their truck, and they see, like, the cannon, the tank cannon pointing into the the cab of the truck and Laurie Petty's character Tank Girl was sitting on the end of it and their accompanying line of dialogue is hello I'm like where's the fucking zinger where's the where's the bit of dialogue that would just make that little moment sing like it's such lazy shit isn't it it annoyed me like Petty playing this character with a script that matches the energy of her performance the effort that she puts into it I'd be all for it um I love the actors playing the Rippers. I think Ice-T, Jeff Cobra, and the late, great Reg E. Cathy are all fantastic. But those characters are introduced way too late in the game. Way too late. They're the only other cast members that click with Petty. You know, in such a way that she isn't carrying this thing on her own. So it's a really big misstep to hold them back to the third act. But all I can say about Naomi Watts is that she is in Tank Girl. It's a really thinly written nothing role. There's nothing for her to do. And it's a shame because I love Naomi Watts always. Like, I love her as an actor and I love her. If she said I could only be with her if you three guys joined in, I could live with that. Provided that Kevin didn't do any puns, Dave didn't tell me that I was doing it wrong, and Tyler just just did not catch my gaze at any point. Don't look me in the eye, Tyler. Don't look me in the eye. You know he'd try to. He'd be hunting for that eye. <laughs> I will not be able to continue if I catch Tyler's gaze. Because, like, if I catch Dave or Kevin, if, you know, I have a glance into their eyes, I figure it would be the same mix of, like, fear and panic that's in my eyes. But I just don't want to know what's in Tyler's eyes when he's, when he's going at it full pelt. I think it will haunt me. I think I'll see something just terrifying. So, you know, I don't think it's going to happen. I think it's really, really unlikely. But, you know, just in case, those are the rules. Kevin's already thinking up puns that he can say, well, we're all, <laughs> we're all making love to, to Naomi Watt. Uh, as soon as you said that, I remembered she starred in the ring. And uh, that's, that was it. <laughs> I thought that's a bad start right away. So, yeah. Damn it. Sorry. I can't, <laughs> you, you, I can't you wouldn't let me down. <laughs> the deal is off. So, yeah, you know, there's some really great, like art direction and production design, sets, costumes, the ripper effects, really, really, really strong. And the soundtrack is very much of its time, but I dug it. But both of those elements are almost rendered completely null and void by the direction and the script. Because this film should be, it should be bursting with, with chaotic punk rock energy and vitality. And there is an attempt to give it some with the designs and the music and the animated segments, but it doesn't work. None of it has any spark. It is curiously devoid of energy for a film that is trying very, very hard to be very energetic. It all feels very workmanlike and perfunctory. 
And it doesn't help that there is, at best, 40 minutes of material here stretched to an hour 45. Not really a fan of this one. Most of the elements needed for a strong film were present. They just needed more capable guiding hands, I think, in terms of writers, director. And it's a shame. I think it's a real shame for Laurie Petty, because in a better film, she would have had a really iconic performance under her belt, I think. And I think the script and the direction really let her down here. Didn't hate it. Didn't like it. No real strong feelings about it. Hopefully they'll come back to it at some point. Don't listen to him, Tyler. I quite liked it. But do listen to him, because I didn't love it either. So just keep thinking, hashtag Cook County Sweet, and you'll be okay. I liked Tank Girl more than I remembered liking the Tank Girl. I think the first time I saw it, I just thought it was too, it was too daft. Uh, I didn't know what it was going for. Tonally, or I was at the age where I wanted it to either be cooler or just more action or funnier. And watching it now recently, I, I kind of, yeah, I kind of just dug it. I don't have experience with the source material though. Uh, I like Dave, so that's always a, a factor. If something's been adapted and you've uh, enjoyed it on other medium. I, I do think uh, Talali does okay. It's obvious this is a film that, for what they want to do, they could always do better. That's it, in most of the departments here. They do try and do well with their obvious limitations. I'm talking in terms of budget and what they do as well. I like the, I like the little touches. I liked, um, like when Malcolm McDowell is a big baddie, walks into his office or boudoir, whatever it is, and there's the, the doorways like the shower. And then, the, you know, the water cuts off as he's walking through it because he can be extravagant and use all that water because he's an evil bastard who can get all the water and has all the power. And, this, you know, water is kind of the most uh, precious commodity here. I like the world building in a way, or the the hints of the bigger world. And I liked the characters in terms of McDowell. I like Tank Girl as a character, although I've never really been a, a huge fan of Petty. That sort of evened out, but I like Tank Girl as a character. You're right in that um, Naomi Watts is just in the film, really. She doesn't get to, I mean, she has seen, she is there, but she's not given anything that makes her stand out, even though she's like one of the main supporting characters. But I like the Rippers. So the villain... Tank Girl and and the Rippers, the, the the idea of the Rippers, even if uh, when they appeared, it was like, oh, that's <laughs> iced tea looking half kangaroo. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's a bit muddled there, but it is what it is for the time. It was okay. I liked the a lot of the little touches with the with the design, the production design. I liked a lot of the small moments. I don't, I don't want this to sound like really sleazy. But uh, Talali actually does really well in a moment where a tank girl thinks her, her boyfriend is coming and she's using scissors. It's kind of, it was like quite a sexy moment, but without being the easy, sort of gratuitous, exploitative moment you would have, you know, if this wasn't the main character. And if this was just, say, a female killing time waiting for the hero to appear. Does that I make sense? I did not sense? like that thing. I thought that was awful. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I was That's not just a how fan. Courtney Love takes off her clothes. <laughs> Pretty sure Courtney Love has to put all of her clothes into a biohazard unit at this point. But <laughs> but I get your point. No, I'm, well, I, I quite like that. And I thought it felt like it was adding to that moment and then you, you know you were going to a different scene but did it I thought Talali did that bit better than a lot of the other moments she did because a lot of the action wasn't filmed that great even as you were saying about the tank scene and uh, because there, there isn't enough there with the script it's not opened up enough just to show a bit more and give it a bit of oomph uh, there, there is a sort of home invasion scene that's really well done that's close to the seen a mention like that that was that was but i did enjoy the i quite enjoyed the finale the the face-off was good 
I like the funky soundtrack. Uh, but it, but Bjork on there as well, and uh, was it was it Cole Porter? Yeah, yeah, Cole Porter tune, and uh, yeah, small role for Iggy Pop. James Hong uh, pops up. I I think I, it was written by is it Teddy Sarfian? Is that his name? I can't. I don't want to pronounce that. No. The only reason I'm now interested in he wrote a film in 2014 called Altergeist. I know what to see it because I know that exists. Yay. That's that's it. Before you go, T, real quick. The thing I don't get is why they tried to force this into being an origin story. It's not needed. They could have just taken the character, because I, I don't know if the comic ever did an origin story. It's still running off and on. Well, what if studios today. not made sure it's... Without one, like but when they made the movie, snob. the character had no it's origin story. It's more of their story. perspective of a lowest common denominator. Which is, it's just they crazy. make sure those people. Yeah, I, I think the thing that annoyed me the most is they kept calling her Rebecca, which is the character's name, but they say it more in the movie than they did in the fifteen years of the comic I've read. But the the other thing is, I mean, that's what was I meaning in terms of the, not necessarily just the budget, but I think I get the feeling that this probably. Just, just any time from the mid nineties to now wouldn't necessarily be the easiest film to push through, simply because it was a female, you know, action comic book character, uh, and we've seen, you know, how long it's taken to move forward with that idea. And which it's is crazy. Title either. Yeah. yeah, which, which, yeah. which I, I hate. I just, I want this movie to be better. That's my problem. Yeah, but I. I get, I got the feeling watch it. I mean, I enjoyed it more than you guys, but uh, with the with the flaws, um, with its limitations, I just got the feeling from watching it that it was seemed to be fighting uphill from the start. Anyway, so I kind of admired more what they got in there, or or what they'd done for the sensibility. You didn't like the the, the sort of comic panels and the the animation ones. I quite liked that as a bit of putting the, the material in there and mix it up with the energy and style that could have could have really done with having more in it, as Greg said. I, I would have liked it if energy it, in that is not. I would have liked it if it felt like a stylistic choice, but it didn't. Every time we see that, it feels like they forgot to do something. Like when you see the house in, in the beginning and then, oh, here's the comic panel of a sign. To me, it felt like they just forgot to make the sign or the the big the end sequence. It to me, it just felt like they didn't know how to film this instead of it being a stylistic choice because it doesn't happen at intervals where it makes sense. It happens in places where they just cram it in. Well, to me, it totally felt like well, they didn't even give us the money for this, but we can put this here. Maybe there's no need to cram anything either because there's not. A- I thought, like I said, there was like 40 minutes worth of material stretched out, so there was no need to try and like cram exposition in. Just, there are plenty of room for it. Okay. <laughs> well, you guys, um, no, this is this is totally one of my favorite comic book movies. Um, even though I'm pretty sure this is the same movie that started the furry culture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they cut that scene. I, I, I did, I have seen this one before. I saw it in the theater. I remember that scene. Yeah. Apparently that's not in it anymore. No, it's not. Uh, I think it's on the VHS, though. I, I think. I, I, I remember seeing it. The title of The Shining started the furry cur- culture, yeah, didn't it? That's true. Uh, I about that hotel scene in The Shining. <laughs> How could you? Um, so, yeah, to me this is just a fun, colorful, little post-apocalyptic punk film. It, it's stylish, and it's so fucking 90s. Um. Lori Petty looks like a mid-90s grunge Gwen Stefani. She's so charismatic and likable. I've always liked her. I, I never read the comics, so I can't compare her portrayal to what was on the page. But I loved her here. It moves at a nice, energetic pace. I love the characters, the practical effects. The set design is fantastic. Um, for a movie that suffered with a shitload of budgetary issues, um, which is why those comic strip scenes come into play, uh, I think the director worked through them incredibly well. Uh, I loved Malcolm McDowell as a villain. He's over the top, and you can tell he had a fucking blast with that role. Um, but yeah, I, I go back to this quite often. I, I think it holds up 
incredibly well on rewatch. It to and it totally makes a great double feature with barbed wire. So um, yeah, there's just there's just something really special about '90s, mid well mid '90s comic book films. Uh, maybe it's my nostalgia boner talking, but I love them. So I'm probably gonna end up picking my own pick this week, guys, because I'm a selfish prick. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you fuck. should you should read the comic. You would love the comic. Yeah, I need to read this because I fucking love this movie, and I, I I've heard the comics are even better. So just like you said, but um, yeah, I love this movie, and I've seen it multiple times. I used to watch it on VHS as a kid constantly, and uh, it holds up well. So and the Blu-ray looked amazing. So Dave, as yes, someone sir. who's read the comics. Yeah. What would you think to a reboot with the people behind Community with Julian Jacobs as Tank Girl? I would watch. I a good fit. Um it'd be an interesting take and I think they'd embrace the the insanity and the chaos properly and I think Julian Jacobs would actually be a fine Tank Girl. I don't actually know who I'd pick though. I mean if if I were to sit down and think about it, it would be an interesting take. That would be worth watching. Well, they got maybe they'll come back to it soon because you know they're uh, <laughs> they're rebooting everything that's ever existed. I hope so. I think Tinker would make an awesome stars show. Or, well, no, not stars. They have no money, but like a Showtime Netflix. or HBO or Netflix series because it should be violent and over the top and full tilt insane. Everything that this movie really is not. The last Dark Horse comic adaptation was a Dylan dog. No, because cause Dark Horse, that wasn't tied to the Dark Horse ones that they did. That We'll call that a, a Sergio Benelli adaptation, and it, it was a bad one. You know, I, terrible. I don't know. Probably Hellboy. It's the last one I can think of. Yeah. It's interesting that Talali directed this from a comic book, but she also did uh, the wonderful Freddy's Dead, The Final Nightmare, which yes, was in... Yes. Which was then turned into a comic form. And I don't, I didn't buy many comics, but I had some Freddy's Dead comics. I fucking lost them years ago. I probably collected them now, damn it. She also did the terrible Ghost in the Machine, which that was also done as a comic adaptation. Cause I have that in a box somewhere. She's done, uh, she's done some episodes of Sherlock, right? The, I don't the, know about Sherlock. She did, um, she did some Doctor Who. Uh, uh, Rachel. The Bumblebee Cumberbum version. I, I think she might be British. Yeah, I so. think so. She's done some Doctor Who episodes. She's done a lot of TV. Mm -hmm. I think she did her career backwards because I was not very complimentary about her directing earlier. And that's earned in her three features. But since those, she's worked very steadily on TV. And she's become a very competent director. So I, I just I think it's a shame that she didn't switch them and learn her craft more. Yeah. But that happens a lot. So I'm guessing from this list, R.I.P. was the last Dark Horse comic adaptation. Oh right, I forgot about that one. Yeah. Which I have not seen yet, so I'll put that on my list. Well, they need to do a Knights of the Old Republic movie because then there can be a Star Wars that is also. A Dark Horse adaptation and just blow Tyler's mind. Okay, I know Tyler's pick, but what say you guys? Oh, well, The Last Picture Show is just glorious. Loved it. Even if I rated Tank Girl higher, I would still, I mean, it would still be tough to beat The Last Picture Show. I'm sorry, Tyler, but it's, so it's got to be The Last Picture Show. Yeah, I thought about joking about splitting the vote, but that's just not funny. It's the last picture show. Our special this month is emo guys that hang out in caves. So, Kevin, why don't you give me your special pick as well as your normal pick for next week? Right, emo guys that hang out in caves. Well, I'm going to keep it slightly light and go for the Lego Batman movie. That's my pick. Interesting choice. I was not expecting that. Thank you. And for next week, I'm going to go classic... And I've not seen too many films starring a certain Ms. Marilyn Monroe. So I've oh. decided to start uh, the ball rolling with 1953's Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. Okay. okay it was a toss-up between that and The Seven-Year Itch, and uh, I'm going for Gentlemen Prefer Blondes. 
Groovy. I God, I haven't watched a Marilyn Monroe film in forever. My pick. I may I may have only seen some like the hot. I think unless I'm forgetting something obvious. I think it's the only film I've seen Marilyn Monroe in. So I thought I should change that. I've had this box set for a while. Groovy. Um, my pick. Uh, we record on Wednesdays, and today is the twentieth anniversary of. I know I keep saying I'm not a big anime fan, and then I talk about some. There are some that I think are absolutely fantastic, and this is something that I absolutely adore. I love this series. Today is the 20th anniversary of Cowboy Bebop, and if you haven't seen it, you should. But in 2001, there was Cowboy Bebop the movie, also known as Knocking on Heaven's Door. So that's my pick this week. I'm pretty sure Craig's going to dig it. I'm not sure about Kevin, and Tyler's (laughs) going to hate it on principle. Are we are we able to just watch a movie, or do I need to cram in? No, like you you two can you can just you can just watch the movie. It is it is a side story. It just uses the characters. It does not connect to the series at all. I heard that before. Yeah. No, <laughs> I have never se- I have never said that. Before. Well, okay. You sit the on the internet of lied. lied. <laughs> the internet lied to me, but I have seen this one. I do know this for a fact that it and does not tie to the name the story. Character. As if, you know, people might watch us who don't know these characters. Yes. Yeah, actually, it, it does. It does. Right, okay. You'll be fine. I'll, I'll trust you on this occasion. Fool me once. You know, shame Look, on you. First... Fool me twice. Still shame on I'm you. I'm still sorry you about did. Persona. I'm sorry about Persona. Don't yell at me. Yell at Reddit. <laughs> it was the only mention I could find of that movie online. And they were like, no, it's fine. It's fine. Don't be angry at Netflix for not putting up part one, three, and four. So I went, what okay. I want to watch one, three, and four. Most, I know. Most normal, most normal people would have given up at that point and went, ah, fuck it, Super Mario Brothers is in. But no. You're like, I found one paragraph online. It should be doable. On you go. That one paragraph swore it was doable, and it was for me and Craig. Just, you know, you got to pay better attention to movies, dude. He's a son of a bitch, isn't he, Kevin? Yeah, yeah. He is. Yeah, this yeah week, he is. This week's son of a bitch yes. is hashtag Dave Grace. Shifting that son of a bitch. <laughs> I might be next week's son of a bitch, too. We'll find out. As always, you can tell us what you think about this week's movies or give us a uh, reason to fear next week's movies on our blog spot, which is raidersofthepodcast.blogspot.com. On our Facebook page, where we are Raiders of the Podcast, you can send us a tweet where we are Raiders of the Pod. On our Instagram, where we are Raiders of the Podcast with a bunch of numbers nobody can actually remember. Or you can drop us an email at RaidersOfThePodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. Have a good week. See you guys. See ya. Yeah. Bye.